Morning. Just woke up and decided to have a little look at the AQA GCSE English Literature Poetry Anthology. As you do. And I found this poem, When We Two Parted, by Lord Byron. And I thought, oh, what a lovely way to start the day with a nice, happy love poem. And so I read it, and now I want to kill myself. You see, this love poem, its tone is full of misery, anger, heartbreak, and bitter, bitter guilt. Thanks, Byron. The poem is also deliberately vague, meaning we've got loads and loads of questions about it once we get to the end of the poem. Let's consider the poem's context. The year is 1816, and Britain is basking in the chilled out vibes of the post Waterloo period. Me so chilled, man. What the chuff does post Waterloo period mean? Well, basically, from 1799 to 1815, this little Torag, Napoleon Bonaparte, has been waging war against everyone in Europe for 16 chuffing years. Come and have a go, if you think you are hard enough. Now, this guy, the Duke of Wellington, did think he was hard enough. Come here, you little pipsqueak. And at the Battle of Waterloo, Napoleon's armies were defeated. Ooh, sacre bleu! Wellington wins! So post-Waterloo just meant after the wars were over and everybody in Britain and elsewhere could chill out and relax, safe in the knowledge that no angry, short ass little French dudes were going to try and invade them all day long. Now, because Wellington was a dashing, hard as nails army dude, he became really famous after kicking Napoleon's head in, and that meant that he got all the girls, he got all the girls. Oh, Wellington, I do love a dashing army chap. <laughs> Wellington, I'm well into you. <laughs> One lass who took a particular shine to Wellington was the rather idiotically named Lady Frances Caroline Wedderburn Webster. You can conquer me, Wellington, any time you like. Well, well, Lady Frances Caroline Wedderbrit, whatever your name is, come here and give us a kiss. So Wellington and Wedderburn Webster began seeing each other. Big deal, right? Well, actually, yes because Lady Frances Wedderburn Webster was a married woman and back in the 1800s when people were much more religiously strict and outraged by naughty behaviour affairs like this one would have caused a great big chuffing stinky bum scandal don't you say great big chuffing stinky bum scandal in your exam because well that in itself would cause a great big chuffing Stinky bum scandal. Anyway. What's going on here? Who's that? Crap! That's my husband. My idiotically named wife is having an affair in the 1800s. Scandalous. Oh, chuffing hell, the chuffing paparazzis never leave me alone. Just because I'm a 21st century style icon and they've got pictures of me in my dressing gown now. I'm never going to live this down, I'm going to be the talk of the town. The talk of the town, of course. Just like Lady Frances Wedderburn Webster and the Duke of Wellington became the talk of the town once the news of their affair came to light. It was a really big source of hot gossip. It was a right big scandal. There we go. Oh, much better. Catch me now, paparazzi. Read all about it! Ah, 
Now, I know what you're thinking. How does this affair scandal malarkey link to the poem when we two parted by Lord Byron? Well, once the news of the affair had seeped out into the wider world, it wasn't long before Lord Byron himself heard about it and he was immediately upset. Do you know why? Because he had also had an affair with Lady Frances Caroline Weatherburn King Wenslessless Will I Am Webster as well. You yeah, had an affair with Byron as well as Wellington. I'm a lady of dubious virtue, okay? Why did I marry you? Byron was so gutted and angry to learn about Webster's new affair that he did what all enraged and jilted writers do. He wrote a miserable, moody, whinging poem. The title is deliberately vague. We Too tells us that there are two prominent characters. Parted suggests that a relationship has come to an end, but we are left somewhat confused because the title is an incomplete sentence that's designed to make us ask questions. When who parted? Why did they part? These questions remain unanswered throughout the poem, so the title, like the poem in general, is deliberately ambiguous and vague. Your mission is to... Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to figure out why the poem is so vague. Do not interrupt me, Tom Cruise, you little geek! <laughs> The poem is made up of four eight-line stanzas. There's nothing too strange about that. But most of the lines are very short, which suggests maybe that the speaker finds it hard to go into too much detail because of all the heartache he's feeling. You know, it's like it's very hard to talk at length if you're really upset. <laughs> A band! My elbow! On a chair! Stupid chair! <laughs> Stanza 1 flashes back to the breakup of the relationship, which was in silence and tears, immediately telling us that the separation was pretty unpleasant. But then we get the line, half broken hearted. Perhaps this suggests that only he was truly upset about the breakup. Maybe she wasn't that bothered, cause she'd already found a new boyfriend. <laughs> hmm. Next, we get a very interesting and violent verb choice. Sever! which is a transitive verb. David Beckham sent... What has he sent? David Beckham eats... What does he eat? David Beckham loves... What does he love? David Beckham loves footballs! David Beckham eats crisps! David Beckham sent you some footballs and crisps! Now that makes sense! <laughs> David Beckham! After the violent verb sever, we get an even more morbid image. Pale grew thy cheek, and cold, colder thy kiss. Now, if you are pale and cold, then you might be A. Ill. <laughs> or B. Dead. Oh, dead body. So lovely. Lovely imagery there, Byron. Thanks. The final kiss of the relationship conjures up images of sickness and corpses. But that does link quite nicely to the theme of death, which pops up in this poem more often than you'd think. <laughs> Dum, 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 dum.
The theme of death. So we've got the pale and coldness in stanza one. Did you also find a knell in mine ear? Which links to the sounds that church bells make at funerals. And then there's the idea of grieving in the final stanza. <laughs> yes, the theme of death lurks in the background of this poem like a spider in the shadows, even though nobody actually dies. So the theme of death is actually just there to remind us that the relationship is dead. And of course, it also really reinforces that moody, miserable and morbid tone. Sadness and misery are also key themes in this poem that are strongly emphasised by the line Truly that hour foretold sorrow to this which is kind of like a prophecy of sadness saying that in the future you're going to feel even more depression and misery Oh. I see the cards and the cards they see you here is my prophecy. You will fall in love with a woman. A woman with a stupid name. I foretell sorrow to this. Oh. You will be miserable, miserable and moody. Right. Thanks. Yeah, I think we get the picture. Thanks. Now, the second stanza gives us an idea about the setting, as we hear that the dew of the morning sunk chill on my brow. This suggests that on the morning of the breakup, it was cold and wet. So, the perfect setting for a big dose of misery. The chill on his brow doesn't mean that he's been headbutting the damp grass. Oosh! It's more than likely a metaphor for the unhappiness he feels. And this dollop of depression was like the warning of what I feel now. This idea of a warning of future misery is once again like a prophecy of doom. You will suffer. Right. Oh, you will cry. In silence, you will cry. Can you please shove off now, please, dozy old bag? You. Yeah, well, I curse your mum. <gasps> ah, not my mum! Now, in the rest of the second stanza, we learn more about the relationship and about a feeling of guilt. Apparently, she has broken her vows, suggesting that she's broken some kind of promise with him. All her saucy adventures and affairs have gained her a level of notoriety and light is her fame, meaning that gossip about her spreads quickly. It's light, it isn't heavy, so it's easy to pass on to the next person and everyone is gossiping. But there's more in stanza two, a sense of the narrator's guilt. Lines 15 and 16 say, I hear thy name spoken and share in its shame. All her saucy carryings on include an affair with the narrator of this poem. He's entangled in this scandal as well, and he feels guilty. And the alliteration of share in its shame really emphasises this feeling of guilt. But, just like the title, stanza two leaves us with more questions than answers. where stanza two left off, basically just banging on about how everybody was gossiping about the scandal. But this was the 19th century. Gossiping didn't happen over Insta chat or Snapagram, whatever. Gossiping happened back then by doing this amazing mental mad thing called talking face to face with other human people. So, 
Where on earth was this gossip happening? Well, you can get a couple of A03 context marks in the bag and discuss a possible setting. Hundreds, the kind of people who had nothing better to do with their time than gossip would have been the aristocratic elite, also known as rich douchebags. Now Byron was part of this aristocratic elite. We can suggest that he was probably hearing all this gossip at fancy parties and soirees for the rich, powerful and wealthy. This is probably where he hears her name and this gossip. And when he does, we know he thinks it's like a bell of death ringing and it makes him shudder. So his feelings are undoubtedly very strong. He asks the rhetorical question, why wert thou so dear? which creates a sense of regret. And things were even more tricky for Byron because at these parties, the people who were doing the gossiping, they didn't actually know that Byron was himself involved in the scandal. Mm. <laughs> Byron, old bean! Oh, <laughs> bean. <laughs> Have you heard about this Lady Frances Caroline Wedderburn Winter Sneeze, what's her name, Webster? Apparently, she's been knocking boots with the Duke of Wellington. <laughs> yes, a real loose gartered girl, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Byron uses repetition to hint at his guilty little secret. He says, I knew thee, knew thee too well. Now back in the 1800s, knowing someone often meant that you'd slept together. Ah, oh, that's disgusting. The speaker seems genuinely gutted and upset about how things turned out. And again, in stanza 3, repetition is used. Long, long shall I rue thee. This suggests that he really is upset by things. And rue means... A baby kangaroo. Rue means regret. Thank you very much, Crocodile Dundee. But again, in keeping with the vague and ambiguous nature of the poem, he doesn't tell us exactly why he feels regretful. stanza shifts in terms of narrative focus and instead of looking back on the ill-fated affair the narrator gives us some concluding thoughts on the whole saga. Byron uses anaphora by repeating the word in at the start of the first two lines of the last stanza. He's going on about how the relationship had to happen in secret and when it all went down toilet he had to grieve about it in secret. He couldn't ask his mates for any help, he couldn't speak to her, his relationship were over. Oh gutted, let's just have a massive cry about it. Then in the final stanza we get the sense that the narrator is actually really angry. And can you blame him? The woman that he loved ended up running off with chuffing Joker Wellington. I get over goes, I get over goes. Yeah we know Wellington, pack it in will you? Byron tells us that thy heart could forget, thy spirit deceive, which is basically saying we had a good thing going. How could you not realise that in your heart? How could you deceive your spirit into thinking some other bloke was better than me? The second line is echoed by the last line, silence and tears, and the sad, miserable poem comes to a sad, miserable end. He says that if they ever met again, he wouldn't say anything to her and he'd just cry. <laughs> you could say that these silence and tears show that even now, after long years, he's still really, really upset about things. 
Or you could argue that the speaker is actually very, very angry and he's going to try and manipulate the woman into pitying him by giving her the silent treatment if they ever meet again. Oh my! Is that you, Lord Byron? After all these years? It's me, Lady Frances Caroline Wedderburn, stupid name, Webster! How have you been? <laughs> Now, the burning question. Why is the poem so vague? Did you figure it out? Byron doesn't tell us specifically that the poem is about himself and Webster. He doesn't give us any details about the affair or the type of gossip that was going around. He doesn't tell us why he should share in the shame. He doesn't even tell us why he feels regretful. So at the end of the poem, we are left with more questions than Lady Webster has idiotic middle names. Now to figure it out, we need to go back to the poem's context. <laughs> about this poem as if it is actually about Byron's affair with Webster. Well, you can argue this because A, Byron was a notorious womanizer who had loads of affairs, so getting it on with Webster will not have been out of character. And B, Byron actually wrote a fifth stanza to this poem, which he eventually deleted. That's why there's only four stanzas now. But in that fifth stanza, he actually named Webster calling her by the nickname Fanny. <laughs> Fanny Megalove, I'm not even joking, look, seriously. He used that name so we know that the woman in the poem was, in fact, Lady Frances Caroline Wedderburn Fanny Webster. <laughs> Just when you thought that name couldn't get any more stupid. So you can talk about the poem being about Byron and Webster and their affair, but also make sure to discuss just how vague Byron tried to make the poem in order for him to avoid any speculation and gossip. Byron, um, your poem, When We Two Parted, is about you and Lady Webster, is that true? You did have an affair with Lady Webster, is that right? <laughs> Well, as you can see in the poem, there is no mention by name of either myself or Lady Webster. It's deliberately vague on purpose, you see. Clever boy Byron with your moody, depressing poem. What else is there to consider? Well, there is the rhythm and rhyme. <laughs> straightforward A B A B but this offsets the very irregular rhythm. Perhaps this was Byron's way of saying that our relationship could have been so clear and straightforward and good like the rhyme scheme but actually ended up completely knackered and messy like the rhythm. If When We Two Parted came up on the exam, which other poem from the cluster would you compare it to? Hmm, I guess it's time to play the strongest link. 
Welcome to The Strongest Link with me, Hen Robinson. And today we're finding the strongest link to the poem When We Two Parted. What ab about Neutral Tones by Thomas Hardy? Byron explores the misery of being dumped, whilst Hardy explores the misery of realising you've fallen out of love with your partner. Bah! Hardy's references to her smile being the deadest thing echoes the cold and pale kiss Byron experiences in his poem. B both these poems are full of moody, whinging, morbid depression, all because of love. Some good links, neutral tones, but, but not quite good enough. No. Today's winner by Elizabeth B B Barrett B B Browning is Sonnet 29, I think of thee. There's no doubt how much B Byron is thinking of the woman he lost and how strongly he feels about her. And this is similar to how much B Browning thinks of the man mentioned in her poem. Whereas B B B Byron is miserable, jealous, whining and moody, B Browning focuses on the intense desire she feels to be with the man of her dreams. B B Both poems explore the intensity you feel when thinking about someone you love or loved and with these two poems, you can compare and contrast the negativity in Byron's poem with the positivity in Browning's. And how love has the power to make us hopeless, moping whingers like Byron, or p p passionate, driven and intense lovers like Browning. So if you are comparing when we two parted, Sonnet 29, I think of thee is the strongest link. Goodbye! There you have it, when we two parted. Now, if you still think that you don't know not, pay attention to these top three quotes.